Merry Christmas from Cornerstone Baptist. We welcome you this morning. What we're going to be doing is centering our thoughts on Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, where the angel came to the shepherds and said, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. So our morning will be organized around Luke 2, 1 through 20, uh, or 1 through 24, and, and about God providing us with a Savior. We'll celebrate this through Christmas carols, through reading the Christmas story, and then through making observations, and then finally observing the Lord's table together. Let's take our hymnals, number 236. 236. Question, what child is this? Let's stand as we sing.
Father, thank you that you express your love to us all the time in many ways, but especially through your Son, for communicating not just your love, but your graciousness, your mercy, but also your justice and your wrath as we watch him bear the sins of ourselves and all mankind. Thank you for this morning that we have to celebrate his birth, his coming to become a man so that he could then take our place on the cross. Encourage us through this time, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So we'll start in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. Luke 2, 1. We'll read down through verse 7. We're going to take it in sections this morning. It says, It came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, or some of your translations might say registered. It was a census. It was for the, for the cause of taxation. So that's why they use the word taxed here. This taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary as his spoused wife, being great with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. So again, our theme is God providing us a Savior. It was a providential um, thing that God did. When we use the word providence, it's kind of an old word that they used a lot three, four hundred years ago. But what we mean is that God was sovereignly and wisely organizing all events of history to accomplish his purposes. So, so we would say something like, wow, my car broke down and providentially this friend stopped right behind me because they were following me and I didn't even know it. And we say providentially, but what happened is God had arranged that before we were ever, ever thought of. And God providentially brought the Savior to us, or the providential arrival of the Savior. He controls everything. And sometimes we're afraid to say that. But God even controlled, even toward, at the end of Jesus' life, before his crucifixion, he controlled evil men putting him on the cross. 2022, many people call the thought that God controls everything crazy, even false. The Bible calls it sovereignty, and we're glad that God's in control. Well, what was he in control of? Look at verse 1. God controlled this dictator, Caesar Augustus, who was living in Rome, 1,500 miles from Jerusalem, um, to, to declare a census. And you had to go to your hometown for this census. And God controlled something way over there to accomplish his purposes here. And he sent out a decree. But yet this decree was heaven's decree before it was Caesar Augustus's decree. Um, notice also, and you wouldn't find it here, but it's in Bethlehem where they're going to go in verse 4. And this is fulfilling what God said back in Micah 5, 2. Thou Bethlehem afraid of, though thou be small among the cities of Judah, yet out of you will come a governor which will rule my people Israel. That was speaking of the Messiah, Jesus himself. And God was bringing to pass this prophecy made 700 years earlier. Sometimes you start making numbers, throwing numbers around in scripture, and you say, that was a long time. For God to say, this is going to happen, and then he made it happen. Um, it's interesting, even in, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, when the wise men came looking for this Messiah. Wh where is this king of the Jews? And they knew 
they, they knew it was going to be in Bethlehem because God had said so. The third thing we see about what God providentially does is he used this dictator in verse 4. Joseph also went up out of Galilee, up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. So God used that dictator 1,500 miles to move Mary and Joseph 80 miles south from Nazareth to Bethlehem to be where the Messiah was going to be born at the time it was going to be born. Because we're going to find that while they were there, God providentially arranged that timing that the Messiah would be born. You see, sometimes, I, I don't know about any of the rest of you families whose wives have been great with child, and you say, let's go for a hike on a donkey or go for a walk, go 80 miles, and, and they look at you as if you've lost your mind. And it's very possible that Mary and Joseph looked at each other and says, but remember what Mary said in chapter one, be it unto me according to thy word. So they went. And God moved all of that. Often what we consider to be mistakes or wrong timing is actually God's providence, God working out his purposes. And then verse 6, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. 280 days. And it just so happened that while they were there, the days came to an end. And God worked that out. It was time. The days were accomplished. God had brought his calendar to bear on their lives. And Jesus would be born. And then in verse 7, God gave Mary her firstborn son. God arranged that. How did he arrange this son to be born? Well, it was poverty. You know, they, they weren't born in a palace. He wasn't born in a palace. God arranged all of that. Um, he wasn't born to, in royalty with the royalty surrounding him. Um, he was surrounded by a lot of people that probably they didn't know or distant relatives that were here for the census. Um, this crowds of people, so they went to the stable. I, I, I don't know how it happened. We're told what we're told. And sometimes I, I think we get the picture of driving up to Comfort Inn and, and they don't have a room available, so we have to drive across over to 133 to, to the barn where Thomas is milking or something. You, you know, we, we think that direction, but most likely the guest room was empty. I mean, it was, was already taken, and it wouldn't have been the best for Jesus with all those people around to be born, so they sent him downstairs. Um, where, where the animals were. And either way, we, we understand that Jesus was born as a common human, not as a spectacular, um, super, super royalty type of human. And we're so glad that he then can associate with us in, in, in our circumstances, and he can understand where we are and what we're going through. So Galatians chapter 4 says that when the fullness of time was come, God sent his son, made of a woman, made under the law, that he would redeem those that were under the law. He came to save us. He came to redeem us from our sin. At the right place, at the right time, God arranged all of that. The question, I, I guess, just a brief application type of question. Um, where is room in our lives for this Savior? You know, as we come to verse 7, in no room, um, have we kind of become so engaged with everything around us and with all the people around us that when the Savior comes, we say, you can be over there. You, you can be in the other room. But today, I, I've got some other things i got to do. So just a, a question for me, for us, as we apply verse 7 to our lives. We're going to sing some more hymn number 227. Number 227.
chapter 2, starting in verse 8. Sometimes I, you know, wrestle with how to organize a service like this. Do we sing first and then read the scripture? Or do we read the scripture and then sing? And, and so we sang first, but I want you to observe as we read how many of the things we just sang about uh, they wrote them for a reason. They, they read it here in Luke chapter 2. So starting in verse 8, there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. 
And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. I'm calling this the praiseworthy announcement of the Savior. There was the providential arrival. This is the announcement. God had provided a Savior, but what good is a Savior if you don't know he's here? So God then announces him to the entire world. Interesting where God started. Once again, it wasn't to royalty. It wasn't to Caesar Augustus. It wasn't to Herod. It wasn't to the priests, even. It was to common people like you and I, shepherds. So it was to common, working-class, normal people there in verse 8. Interesting, we'll see this over and over again throughout the Gospel of Luke as we go through it the next year, is that Luke presents Jesus as man. He doesn't deny he's God. He shows that he's God over and over. But, but his focus is here is a man that God himself became in order to be our Savior. And then over and over in Luke, we see G Jesus himself dealing with common people, um, not to the, the spectacular royalty. Verses 9 through 12, the announcement delivered by an angel. Remember, what an angel means is just a messenger. Well, a messenger from who? Well, a messenger from God. So God sent this messenger and then the heavenly host. Um, the appearance was glorious there in verse 9. Um, the glory of the Lord shone round about him. How did that happen? Well, he's reflecting God's glory, the same as we should each day. The angel's appearance was glorious. His message was good news. I bring you good tidings of great joy, verse 10. Um, notice who it's available to. It's available to all people. Uh, isn't it interesting that you can have good news to all people, but only a few people will respond to it? That sometimes is like that. But that's how it is with salvation as well. The message focused on a person not necessarily an event. Verse 11, unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That is the focus for us. This person was born for them or unto them in verse 11. Um, he wasn't born for somebody else. He was born for us. And that's a great message of Christmas. He was born a Savior. And remember the key verse of Luke is Luke 19.10, the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That really encompasses all of the theme of the Gospel of Luke. This person was the Messiah, and you see that there in verse 11. You say, well, Pastor, I don't see Messiah there. Well, Christ is the word. Christ is the New Testament word for Messiah. He was who Jews had looked for for hundreds and thousands of years, the promise of God was being fulfilled. The person was also the Lord. It's Christ the Lord, verse 11. This is God himself. In Old Testament, the covenant name of God was Jehovah. In New Testament, it's Lord. Kyrios, Lord, is God himself. And this is God keeping his promises to his people. This announcement is being delivered by the angel. Then in verse 13, what, um, verse 12, I'll, I'll just mention this. Um, this is how you're going to, to know that you found the right person um, wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And then this message is confirmed by more than one. You know, more than one witness is good. If you have a whole bunch of witnesses saying, this is, this is the reality here, there was with the angel, verse 13, a multitude of the heavenly ghosts praising God, saying, glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. The glory of God is seen in his desire to be reconciled to sinful people. And the only way that to, he could be reconciled to sinful people is to take care of our sin. And he did that through his son, this person lying in a manger there in Bethlehem. 
who will experience this gracious peace with God? Well, it's people who have received God's goodwill there in verse 14. Um, the people who experience God's grace. How do we experience grace? Ephesians 2 tells us, by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God. So we recognize this morning, Christmas, God sent his son to be born, to become a human like us. Still God, and, and that boggles our minds, but he's still God, but there, that infant in the manger was a human like us. And God sent him. He sent him to then grow up and live a perfect life and then die a death in our place, our substitute, almost like the substitutionary lamb sacrificed. And we're called, told in John 1, he was the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And then we trust in him. And we say, Lord, I have tried to please you. I've tried to take care of my sin problem myself, and I failed every single time. And we recognize our sinfulness, our inability to please God. And we bow before him in humility and in faith. And God saves us. That's who receives peace with God. There are a lot of people looking for peace at Christmas. And they don't find it because they overlook the Savior there in the manger. Don't let that be us this morning. Sometimes people would argue, but pastor, I'm not as bad as the next person. Well, Jesus, Luke, I, I try to refer to Luke, I, I will a lot this year as we go through it, to see how, how Luke himself confirms what he's teaching. Jesus said, those that are well don't need a physician, but those that are sick. And you see, there's a lot of self-righteous people who think they don't need a savior. And Jesus says, I can't save you until you recognize your sin and come to me in faith. So that was Luke said that in Luke 5, Luke 19. He came to seek and to save the lost. Not those who are already had it together. No, he came to save me because I don't have it together. And that's who he came to save. And to, to maybe extend this a different way, our sin is really not determined, or the level of our sin, or the, the awfulness of our sin, is not determined by comparing myself with you, or with the next person, or with my spouse. It's compared to Christ, who is perfectly holy. And we come to this baby in a manger, and it's hard for us to picture a baby who is not selfish. And you try to sort that out in your mind. Did he cry when he's hungry? Is it selfish to cry when you're hungry? I don't know how that worked. But we do know he wasn't selfish because he didn't sin. And there's God in the manger. And we are presented to him by these angels singing glory to God and proclaiming peace to us through this Savior that came. So God providentially provided a Savior for us at the right time, in the right place. Um, he organized everything for us, and then he announces it to us. Um, another word we could use for good news, good tidings, is the gospel. When we hear about the gospel, what is the good news? It's that Christ came to die for us. We're going to have special music now that really is about those angels announcing this good news to us. <clears throat>
I'm glad when college students come home and we get to hear them sing. Did the angels have to take a breath in the middle of that? <laughs> <laughs> those never-ending questions that come to your mind. That, uh, a Savior, a Savior born. Let's sing about that, 223, 223, as we prepare for the Lord's table. We're going to remember that he came to die and came to be our sacrifice. So on the last verse, I'll ask Dick and Mike to come up for the Lord's table. Let's stand as we sing this. taking our place on the cross through his death. We appreciate that. We come in kind of sober realization that that should have been us on the cross. We also come with glorious rejoicing to say, thank you, Lord, for coming to take my place. And if you're here this morning, you've never trusted Christ to forgive your sins. Really, it would be hypocritical to then take part of this 
this table. In fact, it'd be blasphemous. It'd be you looking God in the face and saying, yeah, you died for me, but I'm not going to accept that free gift. So I would ask, if you haven't trusted Christ this morning, to just refrain from partaking of the table. But those of you who are believers, uh, we welcome you. We, we say, remember Christ's death and be grateful for it. to pray for us, thanking the Lord for his body broken for us and the bread that's a symbol of that. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity to be here this morning, especially Christmas morning, where we gather to praise you, Father, for babe in the manger that became the Christ of the cross. And Father, we thank you for our Savior going willingly to that cross where his body was broken for us. Thank you for it. We ask that you would bless this time around this table together. In Christ's name we pray. song saying crown him lord of all he's the king of glory but in order to get to that place he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of a cross and that's what we're remembering this morning jesus as he was there in the upper room with his disciples the night before his crucifixion they were handing around the unleavened bread and he would break off pieces and he held it up and said this is my body which is broken for you this do in remembrance of me
Let's thank the Lord for the cup, a symbol of Christ's blood, shed for us, for our sins. Father, thank you for sending your Son, and thank you for this reminder this morning, this cup, I pray for each one of us that we would recognize the great sacrifice made and then take advantage of it through our faith in Christ's death on the cross. Thank you for this symbol. In Jesus' name, amen. So that song talks about him taking our place and that is amazing grace and that is really what we are celebrating here with a cup because Jesus told his disciples this cup is the New Testament in my blood this do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me There are cup holders under the chairs if you want a place to put your cups. So we have just a little ways to go yet in Luke 2 in this section, and we'll pick up in verse 15. Really, what, what is our response to Christ coming as our Savior? How will we respond to this? And we can learn from the angels and from the shepherds here. Verse 15, it came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven. The shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass, which the Lord has made known unto us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen it, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all they that heard it wondered at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen 
as it was told unto them. When eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the days of her purification according to the law of Moses were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So we see the response really to the message of the angel and to our Savior being born. To stay with the A's, I, I, there was the, you know, the arrangement by God, the announcement by the angel, and then I'm calling this the attendance, <coughs> the prompt attendance to the Savior. They, they responded to the Savior in the correct way. But I want us to notice that it isn't only the shepherds responding. We see Mary responding and others responding as well. The shepherds were first, verses 15 and 16. The shepherds promptly went to see Jesus. Verse 15, let's go now. Not when it's convenient, not after our family get-togethers um, all taken care of here, but let's go now. And then verse 16, they came with haste. They came in a hurry. They didn't wait and they didn't dawdle. I can remember on the farm, one of the things that we had to learn fairly early was when dad said, here's what needs to be done, you, you went and you did it. And you didn't dawdle as you went to do it. And one of the statements made was delayed disobedience is disobedience. You know, if I'm saying he didn't really mean now, then probably I didn't get it right. And here the shepherds have been presented this great opportunity. They look at each other and says, let's go. Let's go now. Rather than taking somebody else's word for it and saying, yeah, I, I believe there is a Savior that was born. I'll let that somebody else go see. He said, no, let's us go. Let's go see what is taken place. And I would urge you, if you haven't come to Christ in faith, don't take somebody else's word for it. Come to him yourself. You will never be sad who you did. And then after the shepherds came to Jesus in verse 17 and 18, they proclaimed Jesus. They made it known far and near. Um, they made known abroad the saying which was told them. Um, they had met the Savior, and now they wanted others to meet him as well. Mary, verse 19, pondered Jesus. A great picture, really, of a humble heart, a humble, trusting heart. Um, she was pregnant without being married, and th just the struggles that would go with that, the accusations, the rumors that would fly around. The long trip from Nazareth, being just about ready to pop. Uh, she, she had had a hard nine months, but yet, she humbly just pondered these things. She, she rolled them over in her mind. She meditated on these things. She, she, she saw God's glory, and she was meditating on it. All she could do is humbly bow in adoration to her Savior that she had just given birth to. Figure that one out. The one she had to feed was also her Savior. And she pondered it. She, she rolled it over. But then in verse 20, the shepherds praised Jesus. They glorified and praised God for what the, they had seen and heard. They went back to work. They didn't just stay in their cloister and their monastery. They went back to work. But they were different. They talked differently. They spoke differently. They spoke about Jesus now. You know, it's a joy to hear about Jesus. It's more of a joy to then go and meet him and see and experience him. Not just a knowledge of saying, yeah, yeah I, I know such and so, when you've never met him, but you know something about him. No, you have met him, you have known him by experience. And that's what happened with the shepherds. And when that happened to them, 
their lives were changed. They were not complaining. They were not grumbling. They were praising and glorifying God. Verse 20. Then we come to verse 21. We see that God himself had named Jesus. Uh, sometimes couples, we didn't know what our children were until they were born. Oh, boy, girl. Um, some want to know. Some don't want to know. Mary knew before she conceived. <clears throat> How? Well, because God knew, and God planned, and God told her his name will be Jesus. Why? Jesus is, is just another word for Savior. Yeah, he will be your Savior. So she recognizes that, but he was named before he was born. Then 22 through 24, we don't spend a lot of time in these verses usually, but Mary and Joseph understood that Jesus was not theirs. He was their responsibility, but he did not belong to them. So they take him and they present him to the Lord. And there was a time, there was a kind of a ritual laid out in the Old Testament about how this would happen, or this gift of God, how you would then present him back to the Lord. But this was a different gift of God but they still went through the instructions God had given. Verse 21, the ritual of circumcision, marking Jewish children off as followers of God, as belonging to God. Verse 22, they performed the ceremony of purification, <coughs> and this would have been a 40-day period of, of Mary um, act, you know, being ceremonial, ceremonially unclean but then at the end of that then they would go and perform this ceremony in verse 24 of dedication where they would take the sacrifice and for them Mary and Joseph they took the two turtle doves which was what the poor people did so the ceremony of presenting their child to the Lord so to wrap this all up this morning, God had provided a Savior. He had providentially worked all of the details out. He can tell any dictator what to do. Any dictator is under God's control. And even when the dictator thinks, I'm going to get some more money out of these people, I'm going to make sure I get all the money out of these people, I can. Even when the dictator is doing stuff like that, God is using them. They are merely a tool in God's hands. And then God announced the provision of a Savior to common people like you and I. Salvation is for us. It's not just for special people. If you're here this morning, you are a human. That means you are a sinner. And that means Christ came to save you if you will trust in him. But then how do we respond? Do we respond with grumbling? Do we respond with digging our heels in? Do we respond by saying, I, I have a little more enjoyment of life of my own that I would like to live first? Or do we run to him <coughs> like the shepherds did? And then once we've met him, we go and run to tell others about him as well. I trust that that is our spirit this morning. Let's take our hymnals and we'll sing about that, 205, as we finish up, 205. Go tell it on the mountain that Christ is born. 205, let's stand as we sing this.
be forgiven of our sin through faith, and then go and run and tell other people about it as well. I pray that today would be one of those days, Christmas Day, when we can celebrate the birth of a Savior, but then also celebrate Him saving us, and then telling others that He can save them too. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed. Amen.